Hello and welcome back, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for another guest speaker session today. I'm joined on stage with Dr. Ken Beatty. Hello and thank you for being here, Ken. Thank Ken you. is the author. Ah, yes, our pleasure. Ken is the author and co-author of more than 140 textbooks and has lectured all over the world on language teaching. He has led more than 500 teacher trainer sessions in 35 countries and is currently a TESOL professor at Anaheim University. Ken, your presentations are always so much fun. They're super entertaining and enjoyable and funny. So I'm really looking forward to your presentation and I hope everyone in the audience is also excited. So Ken, go ahead, the stage is yours. Great, okay, so you'll give me back my thing. So I press here, share PDF file. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's all the technical bits and pieces just making it work, right? So here we are. Okay, fabulous. Okay, well, welcome. Thank you all for being here today, very exciting. Uh, I was just saying to, uh, uh, um, to the founder actually just moments before is that uh, my PhD was in computer assisted language learning. So you are my people. <laughs> Everybody using the computer for teaching and for learning and, and increasingly the, that's everyone today. So we're going to be talking about a few interesting issues and let's, uh, let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so I'm going to start off with a story. Love a story. So a man goes into a grocery store and he goes in to buy some chicken. And uh, and uh, there's just one problem. He can't find where the chicken is, and he doesn't know the English word for chicken. He's looking everywhere. Uh, pollo, gallina, curry, poulet. Uh, Jean is the uh, G is the uh, Chinese word there. I can't remember the Arabic, uh, but he's looking for it and he can't find it. But finally, finally, he finds some eggs, and he and he thinks and he grabs one and he runs up to the cashier and he asks the cashier. He says. Uh, where is mother, right? <laughs> okay, it's it's a ridiculous story. It's really, really silly. Uh, but it actually raises a few questions. It raises a few questions for us. Um, one, did the man get his chicken? What do you think? You can put your answers in the chat there. And do you think that he got his chicken based on that? Um, I'd have to say that I think that he did, yeah? Was his strategy efficient? and or effective. These are two key words we use all the time in our teaching because of course, you know, we could spend days or weeks or years teaching just a few words or something to someone, but we want to do it efficiently and we want the teaching that we do to be effective. That means we want it to be remembered uh, by the learners, not just something that they go, yes, 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 I'll pass a test or a quiz at the end of the class and then whoosh, they've forgotten it by the next day. So uh, the third question is, uh, did he use critical thinking and or creative thinking? Well, I would have to say that I think he used a little bit of both, right? So critical thinking, he's thinking, he looked all over for the chicken and he's, uh, he's considering it as a problem. And then he has to go the step, what's related to a chicken? Because when he saw the eggs, he thought, okay, there's a relationship here. What's the relationship? It's got the egg and then it goes to the mother. And I think that's kind of a creative solution to go and ask someone uh, what, what the word is. And this is fantastic because it reminds us that uh, that our students as English language learners can use all of the linguistic resources at their disposal to solve their language problems. Okay, uh, as an assessment, would you consider him successful? So <laughs> I suppose this is something where you said, okay, your, your assessment is to go get some chicken. <laughs> and you send them off to do something like that. And then uh, would you consider successful? Well, yes and no. It's not, uh, you know, it's maybe more work than it should have been. Um, and it's something I'm sure you're thinking of already. You're thinking, what else could he have done? What else could he have done? You're thinking to yourself, really, right now, what would I have done to get that? chicken and you're probably thinking oh i take my phone i'd look up the keyword or i would get a picture of a chicken on the phone and i'd show them that or something like that you'd have some other ways to do it um, the story basically illustrates some of the issues that i want to talk about today these are them first of all what makes assessment agile 
simple and effective. That's the title. That's a, that's a, in the title of this thing. Uh, by agile, uh, we'll get into all of these. By agile, though, just simply means you can react quickly. Simple means it's not a huge amount of work for the student or the teacher. And effective, uh, I'm talking about this idea of effective because I'm really focused on learning and remembering what you learn. So all of these things are important. I'm going to talk about three different kinds of assessment. Um, and, and ask the question, do your assessments measure the right things? Uh, talk about 15 alternative assessments for you to use. So you're going to walk away from today's presentation with kind of a little toolbox of different ideas that you can use uh, tomorrow morning in class. And then how can we integrate technology into our assessments? We're already, we're already online here and we're thinking about online measures and uh, what else can we do? And then how can we get students involved in the assessment? And I have to tell you right now, I am a lazy teacher. And by lazy teacher, I mean, if there's anything in my classroom that I can get my students to do, I do that instead. But why? Because whenever you're, whenever you're doing something in the class as a student, uh, then you're learning twice. You're trying to build up what you're learning. We'll come back to that. Okay, let's keep going. All right, next. Mm. Okay, agile, simple, and effective. Okay, so what do these three things mean? So to be agile, to be agile really is, is to look at, uh, at your teaching materials and your learning materials and your assessments and question whether or not they're responsive to today's students, to today's issues and today's needs. And this is really something that I love about Ellie. Uh, Ellie allows you to sort of, you know, keep up with the world, keep up with what's going on in the world. If you're looking for things about, uh, about whatever's happening today, you can find it. Uh, now you look at something, for example, like COVID. When COVID started, it was just really a month or so later, there was all of a sudden people had started putting up language learning materials around COVID. And that is so important. It's so important to give students the language that they need to use in their lives every day. And something around COVID is a life and death issue. And at least it, it certainly was at the start of the whole thing. So this is kind of important. Um, there's lots of, uh, you know, textbooks, you know, I, I write a lot of textbooks. It's, 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 uh, we've already said that, but I'd have to say that they're not very agile. Um, why, why aren't they agile? It takes forever to write a textbook, uh, generally about three to five years in a pinch, maybe in a year for really, really, you know, working with a publisher who's very, very eager to do something. They'll push through the ideas quite quickly, but really three to five years is much more uh, common. So something like COVID, if we say, oh, oh, we should cover COVID, again, you're looking like five years from now, and then it has to be so general, it's going to have to cover every other type of disease that's coming like that. So it's not very agile, the publishing industry in general. So again, something like Ellie allows you to do that, but you also need to think that way, think that way in your own classrooms and say to yourself, okay, what am I going to do in my own classroom to be more agile and look around the world and see what is the language that students need. Again, in some of the assessments that we're coming up to, I'm going to talk about ways to do that. So simple, simple is, uh, do you really want to spend your evenings and weekends creating and marking assessment? <laughs> okay, everybody put a hand up if that's you. Probably not. Uh, most of you don't say, oh, Friday night, I can spend the whole weekend, you know, creating assessments or marking. Nobody wants to do that. So what can you do to lower your workload while still giving students the support that they need? You know, these are important questions. Um, in terms of effective, are our assessments, again, measuring what we are teaching? Uh, are they a bridge to what students are learning, uh, the assessments? Is there some relationship there? And I... I, I know if I wish you were all there and I could, I wish I could just ask you all in person each for one example that you had of when you thought a test was unfair. When you went into a test, you looked down at the paper, you thought, we never studied this. You know, I didn't know this would be on the test. You know, she never taught us this. And I know that every single one of you have been through that because I've been through that since grade two, you know? So uh, definitely we've had many experiences like that. And when that happens to our students now, when they, when they get assessments that don't match up with what they're really learning or what they think they are learning, then the motivation 
takes a dive off the deep end. So we want to avoid that. Okay. Um, all right. Okay, so what are some kinds of assessment that we're talking about today? Well, there's three main kinds, and I'm sorry, I know that you're all geniuses, and I shouldn't have to tell you this, you know this already, but I'm just going to go through it for those who are maybe a bit more of a novice to, the, to, the, to, to teaching English. Uh, formative, uh, formative is about giving feedback to helping students. Okay, give that test, give that quiz, but you don't have to write down every single mark. I was, uh, I was a chair of assessment um, in uh, Abu Dhabi uh, for, for uh, 14,000 students across the, across the country. I, so I was the chair of the whole thing. And I had one teacher and I, we were talking about assessments and such, and she gave 94 assessments in one semester, 94 assessments where she wrote down every mark. I said, why are you giving so many? But in fact, I knew the answer. The answer was really is she was trying to teach them how to do the final tests. So she was just really exposing them to that. And it wasn't a good reason. Did they learn English? Maybe yes, maybe no. Did they like English? No, <laughs> I'm sure they all hated it. Summative is what we do is when we're trying to make uh, decisions in assessment about the students' abilities and paths. What can they do? You know, can we, you know, we want to know, are you able to do this and go on to the next level? Illuminative is something nobody ever hears about. I talk about this and people are scratching their heads. They say, what? Illuminative is just simply to enlighten the teacher and or the students about classroom issues. What's working? What's not working? And it's a question we have to ask all the time. A very simple, simple way to do it is just to take a little piece of paper and uh, give it out to each student. Say, what's one thing you really like today? Uh, what's one thing that could be better or you'd rather not do? Or just an act after an activity, say, okay, we tried that game. How many people like it? Should we do it again sometime? And uh, get that kind of illuminative feedback to shape your, uh, to shape your um, learning. Uh, uh, your personal development. Illuminative assessments are really for information gathering. And so it's not going into a mark for the student. And we have things like curriculum development, lesson planning, error treatment, you know, when we see the same types of errors coming up over and over, and evaluating classroom tasks. I have to take a sidebar here just for a second and distinguish between mistakes and errors. We all make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time when I'm speaking. I say something wrong, but I know that I've said something wrong. You don't have to remind me. You don't have to point it out. Unless you're my wife, of course you can do that, right? <laughs> but uh, but errors are ones that we make systematically and we, we read their Deep in, deeply entrenched, and somebody needs to correct you because you otherwise you'll keep doing it. I was a great reader when I was younger. When I was really young, I read so much and so many science fiction novels, and I did it before I started uh, hearing the words. So the word robot, a robot. I used to say robot when I met my wife. Robot. She says it's not robot. It's robot. You know, so robot. So anyway, I, it, it was it was a weird thing, but I went through life without any anybody correcting me. Thank goodness she did. All right, let's keep going. All right, so uh, so what should we assess in language learning? Well, there's many things, phonology, morphology, lexology, uh, lexicon, grammar, and discourse. Those are the basic building blocks of language. We start off with the sounds and what they mean and then build that into words. The grammar or the syntax is the word order. And once we get to beyond that, Many people stop, many people stop. But really, I think one of the most important ones is discourse. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a TESOL professor. I work with graduate students and doctoral students, and I teach discourse analysis, one of my favorite course. And really, it's all about what is not said. When people use different forms, different forms of speech, it's because they're giving a lecture or, you know, different genres of fiction or, you know, they're giving, they're being satirical or different things. And there's that sort of what is the intent of the person delivering the message. And that's something students need to understand. We don't teach it enough. We don't teach it enough. Okay. Um, so what do we assess? What do we assess? Well, well, I think often, too often we focus on memorizing rules for formulaic speech, right? And it's easy to teach. And, and uh, you know, I spent a lot of time and I, I lived in Asia for uh, 16 years. 
And uh, when I was in Hong Kong and China, many of the teachers, they loved teaching grammar. Why? Oh, there were all these rules. There were all these rules and they were so easy to follow, right? So to form the past perfect tense, you use the past tense of the verb to have, which is had, and then add it to the past participle of the main verb, for example. What? What? You know, what? You know, why would somebody learn all those rules? Well, in fact, in many countries they do. And what happens? It stops them from speaking because, you know, you, you go and ask them a question and they're uh, thinking, uh, what tense is that? You know, what, how do I answer that? How do I formulate that question? They aren't learning to communicate. And our purpose is to teach students to communicate, not to memorize rules. So instead, why not ask some concept questions? Like, why do we need a path, past perfect tense? What does it express differently than other tenses? Like, what can you talk about with it that says something a little bit differently? If you give that reason, if you ask students to figure that out and develop that reason themselves, they have the motivation to learn the tense, not necessarily the complicated rule, but they'll learn the tense. Um, we often assess in ways that are easy to mark, right? Multiple guess. <laughs> That's what I like to say. It. Uh, yeah, oh, 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 excuse me. Oh, excuse me, I'm a little bit hungry. Could you could you tell me where there's A, a swimming pool, B, a library, C, a cafeteria, right? Does anybody ever do that to you? Do people ask multiple choice questions in real life? Sometimes they give you a few choices. What would you like for dinner or something like that? But come on, come on. It's not a natural way to communicate. And so why are we assessing like that? We have to do better. What's different now and what has to change, basically, in all of these ideas? Okay, 1996, the first use of digital natives, that term, digital natives, 1996, that's when it came out. Our students are digital natives. They're born. Um, maybe you're teaching students who are much older. Uh, I had one of my graduate students was teaching uh, 89-year-old and 92-year-old. Fantastic, wonderful. But most of us, most of us, we have digital natives. They've grown up with technology. They're comfortable with it. But with, the, with that comfort comes expectations. Students increasingly have higher expectations of their educations and their teachers. This is partly because they can compare things. And they can compare teachers online, and there's even rate my teacher sort of sites that do this. Um, students also expect to pass tests. If they don't, whose fault is it? Never the students. It's always the teacher's fault. Uh, so they're quite demanding now, and rightly so. They're actually spending money on a service. You think, no, they don't. It's the school is free. They're spending time on a service. They are exchanging their time for your teaching. If they're not getting something out of that equation, there's something horribly wrong. You need to work on that. So can assessment work against learning? Well, we have to sort of go through the paradigm of what is traditional teaching and, and you, know, what, you know, how do people learn on their own? So traditional teaching, uh, there's limited resources in the classroom. That's that textbook I was talking about. And again, when we go back to Ellie, that's why I love Ellie, is there's more, more resources that you can get when the ones that you have in the classroom aren't quite enough or don't deal with contemporary issues or special issues that are really only for your students. There's a surface exploration. Okay, finished unit one, let's move on to unit two. You keep going, keep going, keep going. Uh, learning is the focus. You're totally focused on the learning thing. It has to be happening and we're, we have to measure that learning uh, by testing. So we grade the student. What does it mean grade? Grade itself, the word, it sort of means to separate into uh, different areas, you know, uh, not so good, better, best, you know, so you have gradations of things. Is that the way we learn? Is that the way you learn other things? Is that how you learn to play the guitar or cook risotto? Probably not. Probably not. In fact, when we do personal learning, it's completely different. In personal learning, learners explore almost unlimited resources. I cook. I love to cook. Mostly I love to eat, but I love to cook. And I've got so many ways, so many ways to learn to cook. I've taken classes. I've got cookbooks. I look at YouTube. Uh, when I go to restaurants, I ask questions. I'm always curious about it. And when I go to the uh, grocery store, I also ask, you know, the specialist grocery guy, you know, oh, tell me, what do you, how do you cook this? You know, unusual vegetable I've never had before. So it's 
it's almost unlimited, the resources that I have for learning how to cook. What about English? I could do the same thing. Deep exploration is common. You go deeper and deeper and deeper. Why? Because you have unlimited time. You're not saying, oh, this week, next week, and three weeks, and then I'll be finished the semester soon, right? It's like, it's a lifetime thing. Me for learning to cook has been throughout my whole life. And self-assessment is reflective. This, uh, I am always assessing. I'm always assessing myself. Did that work? Did that not work? Is the bread different this time? What did I do right? What did I do wrong? Um, did I burn it? You know, <laughs> are my guests pushing back their plates and not eating as part of it? It's, it's, it's constant self-assessment that I'm going through, trying to see where could I improve in some way? So it's a big deal, it's a big deal. You can see the difference between traditional school. What I'm suggesting to you today is, what can you do to move more towards the personal learning paradigms uh, in which students are going to take more charge of their own learning and give you opportunities to do that? So I'd say amidst this are three trends. Uh, the first one, opportunities to show what you know, asking students, show me what you know. Uh, moving from competition to collaboration and uh, personal and local assessment, personal and local assessment. Uh, personal assessment uh, means uh, about things that are personally interesting to you and local uh, meaning things which are have to do with uh, have to do with you know what's around you your city your country your neighborhood your whatever you know it's it's got to be in there somehow so we have to start by asking the right questions and this is very similar to the grammar question that I mentioned earlier uh, so a question is, what is the capital of Canada? You know, we, we ask these, you know, simple minded questions all the time in our classroom. You know, one student will put up their hand lazily and say, Ottawa. And nobody else is even paying attention. They think, yeah, Hermione Granger will answer the question. I don't have to do anything, right? A uh, better question is if you ask why questions, uh, why is Ottawa the capital of Canada? Oh, 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 I guess uh, it was a political thing. It was between French speaking Quebec and uh, English speaking Ontario. Uh, you know, lots of, oh, it's on a waterway. It's on a river. Maybe that was good for defense. I don't know. You know, so you start thinking, thinking, thinking. And in even in a language classroom, think about the richness of language that starts to explode out of why questions rather than just asking, you know, what is the capital? What do you know about Ottawa is even better? What can you tell me? What do you know about this subject? And we so seldom do that. Ask students, what do you already know about this? If your students are bored or falling asleep in class, you think, oh, they're not behaving or they're not whatever. But sometimes it's because they already know it. We did this last year. Well, you know, it's like, ah. So we need to ask students and involve them much more in their language learning processes. Okay, let's keep going. So we have to position students to solve language problems collaboratively, collaboratively, working together. Why collaboration? You know, competition, keep them fighting, you know, let's let them go. It's just like sports, metaphor, you know, no, that metaphor is dead. Really collaboration is where it at, it's at. Why? Because when you speak, it's not like, I'm talking now, nobody else talk, right? You know, it's my turn. And uh, it's not like that. Uh, it's a collaborative event. When you talk, you have to have someone who's listening. When you're writing, you have to have somebody who's reading. There's, It's an interactive, totally collaborative sort of thing. So instead of having individual students do their work, always put them in pairs, small groups, maybe not so much large groups because then it gets lost. Although I'll tell you a little trick. Here's my trick. When you're teaching, when you're teaching a group uh, and you put your students into groups, number them off. Like say, okay, in your group, one, two, three, four, five, 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 everybody's five. Okay, do the work. And now at the end, I'm going to choose who presents, which number will be presenting. What, what? You know, because normally what happens, you put them in small groups and then they say, oh, oh, you know, George, you're smart. You're smart. You can answer the question. I'm just going to have a little sleep here. Right. And all of a sudden they're all they're all responsible. They all have to pay attention. So argh, it's uh, even, even it's the case where 
if it's a marked assignment, the most, uh, the best uh, English speaker is going to help the weakest English speaker because otherwise their whole group is represented by someone who is less able. So it's a better thing. Make sure they're using more skills, right? We have a lot of things where we just write or we just read or we just speak or we just listen, but actually try to get all four skills involved as much as possible. Um, we talk about inauthentic, constructed and authentic. You know, this is the sort of thing like if you're showing them a menu, uh, you know, a menu from a real restaurant is best, uh, but sometimes we can we simplify it for students. That's constructed. Uh, but inauthentic is where it's just like crazy town. You know, I, I remember this one that I got and it was like strawberry, one dollar you know it was you know it's like nobody pays a dollar for one strawberry it's just it was it was fantastical it was completely inauthentic so in strategies what are strategies that they can use to do this um you know try to make sure that they have to use multiple strategies and that starts with the why questions right when you ask them why again they're not just doing a little bit of research or googling something they have to actually think they have to they have to use different strategy strategies to figure things out personalization we no longer want every learner to study the same things. Um, learners want variation on based on their own local needs and their own interests. Uh, we can't learn all of English. You're not going to memorize the whole dictionary. You're not even going to look at the whole grammar book. You're going to try to learn the language that you use that's important to you. And it's it's different for everyone, right? You know, I, I travel a lot. I go to a lot of countries, especially uh, Latin American countries. I uh, have to speak Spanish uh, a lot and, and in Spanish and in Chinese and in French. You know, I can say, you know, I'm a writer. Uh, I, I, you know, I live in Canada. I'm married i've got two sons you know i can talk about all of those things uh basic things to explain myself and that's important for students to be able to talk about their own interests what do they do question question for you question for you how many of your students will end up flying space shuttles and how many will end up driving cars <clears throat> okay so I'm going to take a wild guess here and say that most of your students will not end up flying a space shuttle, uh, but many of them will actually drive a car. Uh, so what's the difference? What's the difference between these two? It's actually an important thing to assessment. The first one, the first one for the spaceships, uh, a space shuttle, which I think they're no longer making anymore. They're coming up with all these Elon Musk new models and things. But uh, but uh, for those ones, the space shuttle used to cost a billion dollars, a billion dollars, an unimaginable sum. And for that, you don't want somebody to say, oh, yeah, I could probably fly that thing. Give me a chance. <laughs> no, you want the best of the best. And so that's why they would you know, train people for years to sort of fly something like that. And that's where you do want the best of the best. And that's norm referenced. That's where you want that A, B, C, D, E grades because it's really, really important. But for everybody else, for everybody else, and especially for all language learners, it's always the same thing. Um, you, it's more like a driving test. For those of you who have driven, are you a better driver now than you were 10, 20, 30 years ago when you learned to drive? I am, I am. 17, I was a hazard, <laughs> a hazard on the highways, right? I actually crashed three cars, three. Uh, really terrible driver. No, but, you know, I got better. Why? Because I practiced over time, just the way that my language has gotten better over time as well. All of our students will continue to improve their language. What they need, though, our strategies. They need to know how to continue to learn on their own. And they also need the motivation and the understanding that it's up to them now to keep learning, right? So criterion referenced assessments are like a driver's license. You say, as long as you know what the stop sign is, you can figure out these things and you can do a parallel parking, you're, you're good to go. And that's really what we should be doing with our students as well. Okay. Make your expectations clear. Um, as I mentioned, I, I, I taught graduates, I teach graduate students and doctoral students. At the beginning of every semester, I give them the best papers 
from the last year. Um, all the papers are different because all the topics are different, but the paper will give them the format. They'll say, oh yeah, it's got a title and then it's got an abstract at the beginning and mm, oh, somebody used a quote, that's nice touch, right? And this is how you do uh, a APA, American Psychological Association formatting for the references and citations, right? So they get a very good idea about that. When they come back to me at the end of the semester and uh, they hand in a substandard paper, I say, what the hell is this? I said, take it back, look at the one that I gave you, figure out what's the difference. I'm forcing the students, I'm forcing the students to do, uh, uh, to, uh, to be self-critical. Uh, about this. And also when they do projects like this, uh, I, I had a workshop with them and they did these uh, app designs. So I photographed them all afterwards. So again, I can use it next time. So keep that sort of digital information about your students. So what about some ways to test? This is the fun part. So let's explore 15 ways to assess when you uh, and when to use different test strategies and why each one works. Because I'm foremost in my mind is the idea that every test, every test should be a learning opportunity as well, right? Remember all those tests you took as, as students, you'd go and you'd write a test and the teacher, like, especially an essay, this drove me nuts. You know, a teacher, would, I, as a teacher, I would go through and I would detail notes. I would spend my whole weekend going through the papers, give them back Monday morning to the students. Students would look at it and say, oh, A, okay, good, over the shoulder, uh, D. <laughs> terrible teacher over the shoulder and that's it and they're not learning from their assessments so how can we how can we do that a bit more let's see here's some ideas so the first one is called ipsative tests ipsative tests uh ipsative tests ask students to compare two or more things that's really what we're doing at the start of the semester ask your students to write a paragraph or an essay depending on what level they are uh, and then record it on their phones Get them to send it to you because otherwise they'll lose it over the semester. And uh, but at the end of the semester, have them do it again, uh, or it could just be a month later. And and then the difference will show them how much they've improved. You know, you always see students who say, "Oh, how was your semester? You're all finished now. Did you learn?" No, I didn't learn anything. Right? This shows them it shows them and if you're teaching younger students it shows their parents just say oh let me play you two record two recordings for susie this was at the beginning of the semester this was at the end look at how she's improved right this look at her writing look at how it's improved so what do we have here so again why do they work it shifts responsibility to students to self-assess all of a sudden they have to look at themselves and say have i learned have I improved? Is it different? And they become much more aware. And almost every student does improve over the course of the semester. They don't always see it. They don't always see it, but they do. And especially it's difficult if they're taking some of the standard tests because they think, oh, you know, I'm still a B2 student or something like that, or I'm still a B1 student. I don't, I haven't really progressed. Uh, but in fact, they have, they have made, you know, they, within the band, they have made movement. So that's good. It helps to build confidence. And so if you do this throughout the semester as well, you know, day to day, students may sh not see very much progress, but an of test helps them measure how much they have learned. Um, uh, spot quizzes, number two, uh, formative uh, spot quizzes can be used anytime you want to check whether students have understood and can apply the content of the lesson. But don't mark it, don't mark it, you know, give the quiz, you know, the students are tense, they do the whole thing. And then, uh, but don't, don't take in the marks, say, so, you know, did you get 10 out of 10? Fantastic, you're geniuses, no homework for you. Uh, you got five out of 10, what didn't you get? Can I help you? And uh, maybe you need to go back to the book tonight and have a look and go through that again. Let's, uh, let me help you, let me help you focus on what you should be doing there, right? So the, the advantage of spot quizzes, uh, here we are. Why do they work? 
uh, formative spot quizzes, they're not threatening. They're not threatening to students. A lot of students get a lot of anxiety around tests. I'm one of those students. <laughs> I'll tell you. Um, I lived in Hong Kong for 12 years. And, and at one point, we decided we had to take our driver's tests. And my wife, of course, you know, takes a little driver training. She goes and she, you know, passes immediately. <laughs> it took me three times. It took me three times to do it. That same week, that same week, I had my final examination my, um, for my PhD thesis in front of the panel and things like that. Three and a half hours, I was in the room with these, uh, with these very, very critical people and tearing apart my thesis. And at the end of it, I didn't know what I should put up my wall, my, my PhD thesis or my driver's license. It was so stressful for me. Um, anyway, I've got anxiety about that, about taking those tests. Um, anyway, the message is clear. If students don't do well, it's up to them to try to review and to try harder. It's also these formative tests also give them experience in how to do a test. So that's good because then they say, oh, I didn't realize how, you know, multiple choice work or how true false or how short answers should be done or whatever. And again, it's, it's easier. This information helps you understand if your teaching strategies are also working because you're getting feedback here. You give a, you give a, a quiz and people don't do so well, then it's, the problem is not with the students. The problem is with you. You have to think about that. My, um, my oldest son studied uh, international economics at, uh, at the University of British Columbia. He's graduated now. And um, in his last year, he had this famously difficult teacher who the diff t teacher comes in the first day and says, well, I've never given higher than a 76 in this course and probably half of you are going to fail. I thought, what a jerk. What a jerk. What, uh, what kind of thinking is that? Really? All he's telling me, all I'm hearing is you are a bad teacher. With my students, I tell them at the beginning, you all get A's. So I say that in the first class. I said, don't disappoint me. As long as you do this work, it's a criterion-based course. You do everything and you will get an A. It was the first question I also asked uh, when I was hired. I, Can I do that? And they said, yeah, it's up to you. You decide, right? Okay, app-based learning. Many apps uh, that provide language learning opportunities outside of class. There's so many of them out there. Um, you can direct students towards them if you want. And uh, students, uh, the advantage is they can use them anytime and anywhere. So there's things like Duolingo and Babel and so many different ones. There's lots that they don't have to pay for. So maybe look at those ones first. Um, why do they work? An ever increasing number of students have phones and they can learn and test themselves a few minutes at a time. This is the clear thing. They don't sit down with their these apps and do it for an hour. They're doing a few minutes while they're, you know, waiting for the bus or they're on the bus or just before bed or while they're eating their lunch. You know, they just go through the app so they can build that up. A problem, though, is that many apps can be boring uh, because they just repeat the same activities over and over again. The research on Duolingo is that on average, people last three weeks. That's it. Uh, they join, they do three weeks and then they drop it. Um, and they don't have a clear scope and sequence. That's what we do as teachers. We say, these are all the things that you have to learn. This is when you should learn them. Uh, okay, so the scope, everything you should learn, the sequence, when you should learn them and relearn them partway through the semester so you remember. Let students create the test number four. One of my favorites, my favorites, again, because I'm a lazy, lazy teacher. You know, I, I never write tests for my students. Um, I don't like these multiple choice tests. You probably figured that out by now, but um, once in a while, the university insists and you say, <clears throat> yeah, we need a 50, 50 item um, multiple choice test for your, for your students, for the accreditors. It's usually the accreditation agency is demanding this, right? So they want to see some real evidence that's not just me giving them marks. And I said, okay, that's fine. And so I say to the students, okay, every, okay, everybody write 10 questions. Everybody write 10 questions, right? And uh, they say, oh, sir, um, uh, what if we write the same question? I said, oh, <laughs> not my problem. Talk to each other, tell each other which questions you have and share the answers, right? And so they do that, they do that. They start, they start sharing all the questions and all of the answers and, uh, and what's going on here? Of course, they can also do things like this on Cahoots and other, there's lots of other software, but what's going on here? Why does this work? 
Well, to create the test questions, the students have to review the learning materials in detail. When they share their questions with other students, they also share the answers and everybody studies together. Hey, I don't get, where did, where did you get that question from? Lecture three. Didn't you look at lecture three? Did you miss that week? It was, he said it is there, but that's not what he meant, you know? goes back and forth. It's a huge study opportunity for the students. The other professors, they say, what did you do, Ken? You gave them the test. It doesn't matter. They give me 100 questions. I'm going to take 20 or 50 of them and put them on to the test. And uh, it's still fair. And they do well. They do well. But more importantly, they know the materials at the end of the thing. It's a subversive task. It's a subversive task. And I do a lot of these subversive tasks where the students think they're doing one thing, but I know they're doing something else. They think they're writing questions. I know that they're reviewing, right? It's a simple thing to do. Okay, um, create the rules, create the rules, uh, inductive learning. For any rule-based form, remember that uh, past present, uh, past present, uh, uh, or the past uh, passive tense, or whatever we were talking about earlier. For any rule-based form, such as grammar or genres, genres like what's uh, what's how are horror stories written, or you know, or or mystery stories written, ask students to look at samples and figure out the rules or formats. Again, another lazy teacher thing to do. Let them debate these in groups until they agree. Say, okay. So I'm going to give you, par you know, uh, I, every actually even lazier. Everybody choose one paragraph from your favorite book, and then let's see how they're made. You know, like how are they made? Like take them apart, figure it out. What are the rules going on there? So the rules for writing an essay, for example, are pretty generic. And of course, they're just going to look that up maybe anyway. So maybe this is too easy. But if you say, if you have them in class, you say, okay, it's a descriptive essay, or it's a cause and effect or whatever, you give them a couple of examples, not just one, and then they have to look between them and think, mm, what's going on? And they start to figure out the format themselves. Tell me, are they going to remember this more than if I just, you know, talk, 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 talk and lecture them about it? Of course they are. It's going to be much more effective. Okay, why does it work? Students find the rules using problem solving skills. The process doesn't just make it easier to understand, uh, it makes it more memorable. So again, it's, it's, you know, my whole purpose in life is to make uh, learning memorable for my students. Okay, number six, self-reporting with marking rubrics. Okay, marking rubrics are commonly used by teachers, but students can, uh, uh, students can create the rubrics themselves and they can use them to self-evaluate and peer evaluate. I hate rubrics myself. I always get the, I always used to get these from my kids and I couldn't understand them. My kids couldn't understand them. They were just too vague. But when they do that, it becomes a little more intuitive. Number seven, video and photo projects. Talk about personal projects. Say, what, and, you know, you're all doing this. I want you to talk about your family. Take some pictures or take some video of your family because that's what you need to talk about. You live with your grandmother or great grandmother. That's language you need to learn. Maybe not everybody else, but that's important to you, right? So, so again, you're doing, getting them and doing, doing this again. Most students, it seems, you know, starting younger and younger, they've got their own phones. Um, but the great thing about this is they're likely to self-edit. That means that they do several drafts. Nobody takes one selfie. They're going to take draft after draft until they get it right. And then they hand it in. Presentation projects, the same thing. You can tell them to, you have to do a presentation, but do a video of it, yeah? And, and so they put it together. It just forces them to practice a lot more and it lowers the stress. So uh, it forces them to use a range of reading, writing, uh, listening and speaking skills all at the same time. But most importantly, it lowers the anxiety because they've got time to practice and their first draft or their first presentation isn't just in front of the class. Um, solving problems is something students can do with any topic. You just need to think about something that's going on in the news or the world or in their lives and think, well, how could you solve that if you had, uh, if you had some resources to do that? and let them think about it. Asking students to solve problems in pairs or groups helps them with critical thinking and creative thinking and uh, also negotiation skills, talking to each other. They integrate all the things that you're teaching. If it's on the topic that you're talking about, they'll deal with the content, they'll do with the vocabulary, they'll deal with the uh, grammar all together there. Open format projects, 
why should I tell them? I tell my own students, you know, amaze me. You know, most of them have to do essays and I need an essay. But some, once in a while, I'll say anything you like, anything you like. Why not? Why not do a puppet show? <laughs> Especially for young learner, younger learners and stuff. If they want to do a puppet show or a play or a, or a, you know, send a PowerPoint, whatever they want to do, or make a little video, let them do that. Let them individualize it. And again, we don't have to have every student doing the same work. Uh, I'm trying to speed through. I know that I'm going to get slapped here if I don't finish a little bit earlier. So forgive me for going a bit quicker. Um, all of this will be available as a video afterwards for you. So um, and and my email is on the last slide. So please reach out to me if you have any questions. OK, let's continue. Portfolios. Throughout a semester, students can collect examples of their work and then choose. Not me, you. Students, you choose the best examples for a summative uh, assessment. I, you can say uh, students can keep digital videos of their presentations as well as digital files of other work, like if they do a poster or something like that. And for you, keep copies for next semester, just like I do, to show your students afterwards. Why do they work? Why do they work? Well, um, I this is my friend. The picture is my friend Greg Pace, my old one of my oldest friends, and he is a, a world a world acclaimed potter. He's one of the Order of Canada for his pottery, for its contributions to ceramics, and he was professor of uh, ceramics for 25 years at the University of Alberta. But he um, uh, he went to Banff School of Fine Arts, and at the school, uh, they spent all, he spent the whole year making ceramics, but at the end of it, they were only allowed to take home three pieces. What did that do to him? What did that do? It meant that every day he went into the studio, he made something, and then if it wasn't the best thing he could do, start over again, right? So it shifts responsibility to the students. Also investigate the ungrading movement. Um, ungrading is about uh, basically not grading at all or really dropping most of your grading, uh, maybe until the end and f letting the students figure it out. Gamification, gamification is a trend and learning. Uh, learning objectives become the game objectives, whatever you want, and paths to reach them through practice and repeated play. That's what we would do when we play a game. You don't play chess once and then say, oh, well, I'm done. I guess I, I know how that game works. You don't. You play it over and over again, maybe for your whole life. Uh, with language games, we can ask students, again, lazy teacher, get them to do the work. Say, I want you to take what we're learning with the grammar this week and make a game, right? And it doesn't have to be every student, every class, but maybe each week, a different group of students say, make a little game. That way, they look at what the students did last week and they do something new and better and better and better. So again, they're still doing all the vocabulary, the grammar, the content, everything else, but they're exploring it in a more interesting way. Number 13, make students the teachers, right? Again, you're getting the you're getting the theme. I can see lazy teacher, right? Okay, yeah. Portions of each lesson can be taught by students. Give them time to prepare and how they think they should be assessed. Ask them, say, okay, you're going to do this. How should I assess you? Right. And it's amazing because all of a sudden that question thinks, uh, uh, well, um, I guess if I do a good presentation, well, what is that? What, what is a good presentation? They're having to reflect and figure it out uh, how all those pieces work. Why does it work? I mentioned this earlier. To teach is to learn twice. Right. They're asked to teach part of a unit. Students get a better understanding of the challenges of teaching while making use of many communication skills. I guarantee also, this raises respect for teachers. As soon as students have to sit on the other side of the desk, oh, all right, okay, this isn't as easy as I thought. <laughs> so they get more respect for the teachers. It's a great thing to do. Uh, 14 is predict the test. This is a weird one, a weird one, uh, but it's very, very useful for you. And it's kind of an illuminative, remember that word, illuminative assessment uh, thing where you ask the students to predict what is going to be on the test. What do you think will be on the test next week, right? And, you know, give them some time to think about it, to talk about it in groups. Say, no, no, yes, yes, yes. Well, oh, it must be this. No, 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 I don't think so. Well, I don't even know what you're talking about there. Ah, that's the important one, right? Where they say, what, does I, did I miss that last week? When, when did she talk about that, right? And so, so they predict it and then get them to rank that, uh, get them to rank their choices, which means, you know, what's the most likely, least likely one and everything in between. Task provides you, the teacher, with uh, a lot of ideas about what the students think they have been learning. 
It gives you a good insight into that. Students will also remind each other of all the important points. You can discuss the mistaken points with them and, and, and go forward with that. Okay, good things. This is my favorite one. And this is a very, very personal one that I did. Um, I, I love to believe that I, I think that I'm a better teacher today than when I started uh, started teaching. When I started teaching, I used to do something I'm so ashamed of. I used to take the worst paper, the worst essay, take off the student's name, but put it up and then go through the points and the problems that students were having. Oh, a terrible thing to do. I do the opposite now. When you mark a group of students' essays or presentations or anything else, keep notes on at least one good thing done by each student, including by the least able students, most importantly, the least able students. Share these with everyone as examples. So, um, Here's, here's some examples of what I do. Uh, students need to learn from what others do right. So instead of just talking about this is wrong, this is wrong, that's problem, this is a grammar thing, that's spelling thing. No, tell them what's good. So I, I take in, you know, all my students, and I remember this one, Yudi, Yudi was the weakest student. Um, she was in Colombia, and all these students were in Colombia. And um, some of their English was not great, you know. Uh, and again, they're improving, but her title was a good title. So I thought, okay, the rest of the paper was crap. <laughs> I thought, I'll praise her for the title. You know, somebody else, Gloria quoted somebody, Sandra incorporating a reference in an interest way, Daisy on language, and so on. So you start seeing all these things. So I do one for each student in my class and just quickly go through them. And then again, I'm sharing the, uh, the PowerPoint. So uh, they've, they've got that. They've got that idea. Okay, so what's the point? What's the point? Yudi goes home and her husband says, oh, how was class tonight? Uh, and she says, oh, it's good. It was good. He said, oh, oh, and the teacher liked my title. <laughs> and she feels motivated and inspired and, and she's also seen what other students done, have done. Okay, so that's a lot of information. What do we know? Um, just to summarize, assessment can be better. It can be much better. Make your assessments agile, make them simple for you and for the students and really question, are they effective by which point I mean are the students remembering it after they walk out of the classroom. The point is not to go through an English class and pass tests. The point is to be able to communicate. Question your assessments. Do they measure the right things? And again, asking the students like that question, like was the test about what you thought it would be? And everybody says, no, question 18. None of us studied that. Okay, I'll take that off. Yeah, no problem. Okay, okay, I got it. You know, I'll do a better job and I'll look at what I was trying to teach. Try alternative assessments, some of the 15 that I've suggested here. Integrate technologies such as phones and uh, for photo sound recordings and uh, videos that they can do for part of their assessments. Again, the point is for them to show you what they know not just repeat and regurgitate something that you've taught them. They're not memorizing the grammar uh, book or the dictionary. Get students involved in the assessments. Make them part of it. Make them more responsible. Make them think that, yeah, this has something to do with me. If I'm not doing well, I've got to do something about it. If students hate a test, consider why. Fix it. Do something about that. Okay. All right. Um, my name is Ken Beattie. Thank you very much. Uh, here's my uh, email, uh, kenbd at mac.com. And I've got a little website there as well that I need to update some more, but, uh, but uh, there we have it. Okay, so now I think we have some time for questions. Am I in the right place? Okay. Yes, you are. Okay, great. Yes, we're gonna go into some questions. Ken, that was amazing. That was a really, really great presentation. I feel like I took away so many things from that. So thank you so much. We have just a few minutes for questions. So let's see if we can get through maybe one or two. I'm just going to take a quick look here and I'll show one of them on stage. Okay. Here's a question from Felicia and she asked, do you have any tips for calming testing anxiety for teens? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. There's a few things you can do. First of all, making sure that the students really understand the format. So a lot of times students walk into a test and they think, oh, it's multiple choice or, oh, it's short answer. I didn't know that or whatever. So make sure they really, really understand this is going to be the format of the test. Um, give practice tests. Let them do practice tests as much as possible. And with my own students, I, I say, you did a terrible, that's a terrible essay. <laughs> I said, do it again. You know, do it again. Again, I never ever say to students, I said, sorry, you failed the course. No, I always say, I'm going to help you. You know, this is terrible. I'm going to, I'm going to write half of it because it's such a terrible essay, but you have to write the other half and help me out here. So again, making the student really understand that it, they're not being judged. It's trying to show them what they know and what they don't know and, uh, and where they can improve and that you're on their side. You're going to help them through this. And that's part of the reason for the test. So a few different strategies to use there. Excellent. Okay. Awesome. Great answer. Let's try. Let's do one more. I think we've got time for one more here. And this one's got a lot of votes. So uh, what do you usually ask students to compare in Ipsative assessments? Did I say that right? Ipsative? Yeah. Ipsative? Ipsative. Excellent. yeah, that's right. Yeah. Awesome. For example, a beginner okay. adult. Right. Okay. So again, at the beginning of the semester, what are you, it depends on what you're teaching. Are you teaching reading, writing, speaking, and listening? Probably. Uh, or maybe you're just teaching a, a, a narrower skill, whatever it is, you ask the students on the first day to write something that will, you know, that you can ask them to rewrite at the end if it's writing. And, and if, I think ideally you get them to write it and then maybe read it aloud onto their phones, make a recording and send you both of those. What happens at the end? Again, you just are giving that back to them and you don't have to do anything. You don't have to say, oh, look how you've improved. You don't have to do it. It's up to them to figure it out. What have I done better? Uh, what could I do better? You know, is my accent better? Is it, uh, is it still the same? But am I communicating? Am I using better words? Uh, give the, you know, give the same assignment, but don't give them the first one until they've done the second one. And that way they can compare. Uh, just make sure the topic is the same. Ellie, 